Okay, folks. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And it's really George is a hard act to follow if those who were watching George from before. So, um, and I hopefully we'll have our ducks in order here. Randy will for this session as well. So I'm going to just so folks show up at the top. Uh, I'm going to put our co-hosts to our panel members. And as everybody comes in, everybody keeps moving around. <laughs> okay, hey, co-hosts, I got a Frank. <laughs> it's like trying to swat a fly. <laughs> as soon as, as soon as I land on someone, another person comes in and then the names move up. So sorry, hang on a second. Let me do this maybe easier here. Yeah. There you go. Don't do it from participant link as they come in. Do it from the uh, pictures. It's the easiest I've learned. Okay. Um, Michael, Mr. Barber, who am I missing? That needs to be a co-host still. Amy, I got you, right? I need to see. Okay, we'll just give it a couple more minutes as Oh, Bruce. Okay. Anything else? Uh, by the way, because the recording's being done automatically, um, know that we'll cut out all this banter at the start, <laughs> just so you are aware. And Bruce, if you're, are you in yet? Yes, Randy, I am. Oh, there you go, perfect. Okay. There he is. Okay, we'll make you a co-host. So on the list, we all show up at the top. There we go. Okay. And welcome everyone. So I'll leave the, uh, uh, I'm not gonna pin anyone's video so that, uh, because there's too many of us and there are a couple slides for orientation that we'll have. So, um, and no, there's no video. So Randy will not screw up on telling everybody, make sure you click the radio buttons and then not click the radio buttons himself, which is so like me. As we all know, those of you that have endured with me for the past little while. Okay, there we are. You are in the Cross Canada panel. So this will be where the recording will start. So thanks, everybody. Welcome to the Cross Canada panel. Uh, it's our pleasure as a Canadian eLearning Network to be here, be a part. We've got with us on the panel, uh, Amy Sandville from uh, Saskatchewan, Michael Barber from uh, The Rock, Newfoundland, uh, but also he's vacationing in Vallejo, California right now. Bruce Weitzel from uh, Vernon, sunny interior, uh, as well with WCLN and also on our board. Um, myself, Randy Levante, I'm assuming everybody knows me as I was going through the list of the 200 and 50 odd people who were in the first session. Uh, oh, I'm not sure who you are, but that kind of thing. So uh, Michael Canuel, CEO and founder for Canny Learn as well is with us uh, and everyone will get a chance to introduce each other uh, themselves after, tell a little bit more about themselves when they uh, are speaking. And uh, he's in Quebec at Learn in the Anglophone. Um, interesting things going on in Quebec. Well, and in Ontario, unfortunately, Todd Pottle couldn't be with us as well, but Frank McCallum is who is the board chair from um, 
from uh, uh, Vista Virtual in Alberta. So in case you were unsure what we are, we were a group of people that randomly met at conferences in the US uh, that decided to have our conversation instead of situated in the US to actually try to bring the conversation here into Canada. So we formed an organization back in 2014 was when we did this after a series of meetings, a lot of support from some of the people that not only drank the Kool-Aid, they actually made the Kool-Aid for others to drink. Um, and uh, so there's uh, Michael Barbers. Well, the two Michaels have been around from the start. I think Bruce, you were there very in the early days as well. Uh, and others that have joined in afterwards as well. And some folks that were instrumental in founding this uh, are not necessarily active with the Candy Learn, uh, but they have continued to be supportive. So, and our mission has been really to focus on being leading voice. So we really find uh, that we cut ourselves as a national nonprofit as being research focused, professional learning focused so that we can have informed discussion and dialogue about what makes success in online K to 12. So by sticking close to that, we've been very easy to make relationships and partnerships with those that support technologies, those that support curriculum, that those that support instructional design, online content, and our relationships with all of the post-secondaries who are also heavily involved in this. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. One of the, the most important things that we have done is partner with Michael Barber, the State of the Nation. I'm sure most of everyone is familiar with that as well. Uh, so that we uh, have done and that focus and be it's kind of central to supporting what it is that we're doing. And then we also have a number of research projects that are published. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of the, the session uh, for the research pieces, but also we're going to talk a little bit as well about what's going on in the other places across Canada. So let me stop sharing there. And let's go to uh, maybe some quick introductions around for each of you. And why don't we go geographically? And Michael Barber, I'm going to put you back on the rock where you came from. So if you want to start off. Uh, sure. I'm Michael Barber. I'm an associate professor of instructional design at Toro University, California, in, uh, on beautiful uh, Mare Island in Vallejo. And um, I'm the lead researcher for the uh, State of the Nation K-12 e-learning project in Canada, as well as involved in several other research projects uh, that the Canadian e-learning network does. I think the other Michael would be next if we're I guess going I'll, east I'll to go west. Back. I wasn't sure if I, I was waiting for a cue from Randy here. Sorry about that, uh, everyone. Bonjour, salut tout le monde. Uh, I'm here in the beautiful province of Quebec. It's uh, uh, minus two outside and uh, we're cold. I'm the CEO of LEARN. Uh, our, uh, we're a nonprofit organization and our mandate is to serve the uh, educational community of, of Quebec, the edu English educational community of Quebec. However, we do work very closely with the, uh, uh, our colleagues in the, in the French schools across the province. And we've been around doing this for 16 years. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here and to join you today. Thank you. I think next is Amy, right? The geography is correct. Yeah, it's a big jump from Quebec to Saskatchewan. My name is Amy Stanville. And I am the principal of Regina Catholic Learning Online. Um, we are an online school. and. We do grades one to grade 12. And to, oh, this year we were just a high school. So we've added an elementary in kind of this wild and interesting year where we've kind of changed what distance learning looks like in our province. So I'm really excited to be able to share some of our experiences and um, speak to how we've kind of changed um, things that we are doing in our province to kind of accommodate the pandemic. And I'm Frank McCallum. I'm the associate principal for Vista Virtual School. Uh, we cover all of Alberta, but I'm based in snowy and cold Calgary today. Um, I'm also the chair of the Candy Learn Society, as Randy mentioned, so have a big interest in what's going on in distance education across the country. But as Amy referred to, it's been quite a wild and woolly year, and uh, there are some changes afoot in Alberta. Hi, I'm Bruce Weitzel. I'm the current um, executive director of 
Western Canadian Learning Network, formerly the principal of VLEARN in the Oak, sunny Okanagan. Uh, looks like we're cooling off, but we've had a week of about 24 degrees up here, so uh, summer's coming early. Really happy to be a part of the panel today and share a little bit about uh, uh, what's going on in BC, but more critically, uh, listen to uh, folks across Canada, because I imagine most of those folks on today are from uh, British Columbia or the West Coast. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everybody. Um, and uh, so some of the folks uh, here in the room are familiar, have been connected. Actually, some of you have drunk the Kool-Aid, but uh, if you haven't, we're going to make a tasty cup for you and hopefully get you actively involved. The network is really based on a lot of volunteerism and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from those who believe that sharing together is going to make us stronger. Um, it's interesting, we, uh, as a group, we put a, a request, or sorry, a proposal into the Digital Learning Collaborative, which was the US uh, equivalent now of those that are into blended and online learning and supporting it, that were formerly with INACL when its focus was there, but INACL changed its focus to more competency-based education as well. Uh, and then that, uh, that event no longer became the place where we used to come together as Canucks and, and talk about good things in Canada. Um, but with DLAC, well, what we've done is uh, put a proposal in, which is interesting, that, and called the Compulsion for Collaboration. Uh, and so speaking a lot in terms of how we come together and how we managed collectively as a group in Canada, particularly in the digital learning space around online and blended, is we've had to learn from each other. It's really been uh, an interesting piece. Uh, Tony will make a comment about that tomorrow at the session as well. But I think what's the, the way in which we've survived has been to collaborate with each other to contribute and see if we can be a little bit stronger. So it's very much like what Bruce in the, the over the years in terms that started as cool school that is now really morphed into uh, WCLN is now not just BC, it's Western Canada. Uh, and so very similarly, Canny Learn has, is connected with all of the consortiums uh, across. So there's some interesting things that are happening both in BC for those of us that are situated here that we're familiar with, but as well uh, that are circulating around in um, Alberta. And I see Allison just popped up and welcome Allison Hancock from uh, Palliser Beyond Borders. So in Alberta as well. So I, I think that this is a discussion we wanna share openly with what uh, we have across Canada to be. But, I think one of the most important things, I don't know whether um, Michael and uh, Barbara, if you have anything that we should add about some of the things that are coming up. We have some sessions as Kenny learned in sharing. So the design principles, which were kind of central to informing quality for BC. Uh, Susan Crichton has a session this afternoon with that to catch as well. And then tomorrow uh, we did a whole series on the pandemic. Uh, in terms of what activities and actions were occurring in all of the provinces. So Joelle Nagel is here and doing a session, I think it's at 10.30 uh, tomorrow on Friday. So anything else to add in, uh, Mike? Not that I can think of. I'll drop a link in the chat to um, just a quick presentation, a little six minute one we did on the State of the Nation, um, which I think you've got circulating somewhere on the website. I've dropped in links to the emergency remote teaching that Joelle's doing tomorrow in the chat, as well as the general state of the nation site. So beyond that, I think we're good to go. Okay, so um, one of the things we thought we'd do and, and take some questions, but I think we can group it um, be, into Atlantic Canada, maybe just a quick, Mike, if you could just do a quick sort of update about um, what's happening, because I don't think things have changed too much there. Uh, and in terms of pandemic, but they are also in the, the bubble, the Atlantic bubble that's occurring, which is there. In Quebec, we have some interesting things, which some of it relate to technology and a lot of it doesn't um, that affect. And so I'm sure that we'll get some interesting insights from, from Michael on that. Uh, I think that we can all take on a bit around Ontario, but I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna scroll down to see if anyone is there here in the, the participants is from Ontario. We would invite you to chime in when we talk about Ontario. Uh, and then we'll come all the way back across to Saskatchewan, the big leap. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to Alberta and invite a few folks with Frank to have a discussion about some of the things going on in Alberta. And then we'll conclude in BC. But the whole symposium really is 
a bit of a, an open around what's going on in BC with the sessions that are planned for these two days. So, uh, so Bruce is kind of off the hook. He just gets to answer questions, I think. But that sounds reasonable. And we have until 10 o'clock um, on the, 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 the writing, sorry, at one o'clock uh, uh, for, for you uh, back east. But we also are going into the break. So we can extend that. Um, but we also would not be offended if you uh, have to rush off for other urgent things and or you want to get into Kumo space and play around in that area as well for the 10 to 10.30 break or um, do something else. So back, back to you, Ms. Barber, a little bit about what's going on in Atlantic Canada. Sure. Um, well, I, I guess the as Randy indicated, there's not a lot of change that's been happening there over the years, largely in part because of three of the four provinces, so Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, all have single province-wide programs that are operated, um, in the case of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, out of their Ministry of Education, in the case of Newfoundland, out of the Newfoundland English Language School District, which basically, uh, Newfoundland has two school districts one English district for the entire province, one French district for the entire province. So it's just as well to say that it's really being operated out of the ministry, although they're employed by the district now. Um, I think the only real new thing to report is that uh, PEI this year, um, starting in the 2020-21 school year, is actually piloting uh, their own online program, and they haven't had one of those um, I think they gave it up about nine years ago. They had a video conferencing distance uh, program that was primarily used by their francophone population um, that they phased out and they've always just essentially had an agreement with New Brunswick to use their programs and usually only have about 120, 130 students or less that uh, enroll it. But this year they are piloting, I think it's three courses, something like a half dozen high schools um, where they're trying to build their own internal capacity again. Yeah, thanks. I think the other thing that's interesting is because of the size um, of the, the, the sort of the provinces and the number of students is there's a very tight connection between what's done in the online for K-12 and the Ministries of Education. As a matter of fact, Sue Taylor Foley from the Ministry of Education in New Brunswick, i uh, sorry, Nova Scotia has been uh, a member of the board and one of the founding members as well. So Candy Learn really kind of represents both across uh, those areas but primarily focused on the practitioner's uh, view in terms of what happens with feet on the street. Um, so it's nice to be there. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in Quebec and all the social upheaval. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot and I, I, I know I only have three, four minutes, so I'll try and be as brief as possible. You probably have heard there's a ruling recently on um, uh, how we were a secular province and uh, you can't wear hijab to teach in class, no religious symbols. So there's a lot of controversy going on around that currently. There's also uh, issues tied to the fact that our teachers are uh, uh, have already gone on strike for a day here and a day there. They've been very creative about the way they've been doing it. Um, but maybe just to give a quick overview is that the, the political, and I'm calling it a political decision, back in September was that they would try as much as possible to keep our schools open. Um, it reflects generally an attitude that um, uh, online education is the poor cousin to face to face. And uh, uh, there was a lot of argument made about the necessity to do this for the mental and well being of the kids and their, their uh, and socialization skills. So there was a lot of um, issue around that. However, recently, because of uh, uh, outbreaks in, in, in certain spots within the province, certain schools have had to actually go back to online or hybrid, uh, uh, one day on, one day off. Um, and it's led to a lot of confusion. We see a lot of teachers uh, resenting you know, the fact that there's no consistency, no coherence in the, in the, in the policies of uh, coming out of our ministry. And um, as I said, combine that to the fact that we have uh, um, legislation that wants to abolish English school boards, you know, and uh, we're fighting this sexual, secular uh, legislation and we're fighting a teacher's strike um, and parents are, are frustrated with uh, a lot of the, the constant changes in policy. So we're, there's, um, there's no question that we're living through a challenging times. That's a, a nice way of putting it. Um, uh, there's no, as I said, a big, uh, the big push though has been to online tutoring. 
uh, this year alone, uh, we've already, well, by the time the school year is done, we'll have tutored 50,000 kids across the province. And that's just in the English sector. So uh, they're trying to compensate in places for what they're considering a loss of uh, learning, although again, questionable uh, areas around that is debatable. But um, learning skills at the elementary school seem to be the biggest concern, uh, reading, uh, writing, and basic math skills. So um, the government has put a lot of time and effort into uh, uh, supporting online tutoring. And that's what we're doing here at our organization. So interesting, challenging times for us, uh, but uh, I'm sure it's the same for everyone else. And that's a, a quick snapshot of what's going on in Quebec. And that only touches the, the, the surface. <laughs> So, so is there K to 12 online learning going on in the Anglophone more so than the French? And I think that REFAD does have programs per se, but they're more distance, right? Uh, yeah, it's really, well, REFAD is, again, doesn't touch much of uh, uh, the elementary or secondary. It, it really moves more towards a, a post-secondary actually. They don't do much there. Um, is there going on? It's uh, hit and miss sporadic. Um, uh, there's just been such inconsistency um, uh, coming out uh, in the policies coming out of our, our ministry that uh, uh, some boards are actually doing it, some schools are following it, some aren't. aren't. Um, the vast majority, they're still pushing for face-to-face. -face. That's really what they want to see and where they can avoid online, they're avoiding it as much as possible and pushing for face-to-face. Uh, -face. And it reflects that attitude I was talking about that it's still seen as the poor cousin and it is the poor cousin as long as it's done poorly. So we move over to Ontario, which is quite the opposite if we take the uh, announcements that were brought forward by Simon Litchi, the Minister of Education. Uh, originally, I think it was back to 2019, wasn't it when they, in March, the, um, the, the announcement was made about mandatory four e-learning courses? Yeah, it's, it's been a sort of a progression because what actually, if you look at the exact trajectory in February of 2019, they released their class size consultation documents, which was where they proposed to increase the e-learning class size to be 25% higher than the face-to-face. -face. Then in mid-March, they announced that they wanted to centralize the system, which we didn't quite understand at the time because it was already a fairly centralized system. They were gonna require four e-learning courses. And there was another part that I can't, there was a third thing I can't remember now. Um, then in November of 2019, they decided to backtrack a little bit and it was only gonna be two courses for graduation. Um, and then um, in the legislation that was passed, well, they started in I guess, May, June of 2020, talking about um, they were going to centralize through TVO or TFO um, in terms of their services. The legislation that was passed as part of their COVID relief in late July, early August of 2020 actually put that into practice, even though they were still in the process of consultations. Uh, so the legislation that actually allows it to happen has actually passed. Um, and um, they had further consultations in October, November of this year, and then some more that happened in February of uh, 2021. Um, but uh, basically, it looks like everything that uh, TILO used to do as part of the ministry unit is going to transfer over to the uh, TVO and TFO. Um, similarly, a lot of the functions that the consortiums used to do um, are going to be centralized into TFO and TVO. And as best I can tell from looking at the legislation, the intention, although it's not spelled out there, is to actually prevent the consortiums from doing those things. Um, whereas now, while, like as an example, the ministry under TILO has an enrollment system, but many of the consortiums use their own system because they uh, find it to be a better one, and there's nothing that prevents them from doing that, whereas it looks like under the new model, they'll be prevented from doing their own things. So is there, is there anyone here in the crowd from Ontario that can chime in with uh, a little bit in terms of maybe feet on the street, a little what's happening around there? Because we see media reports around trustees that are speaking out, uh, and the, obviously uh, the unions uh, as well, teacher unions, have been objecting to this. They're, 
the rhetoric in the media is that it's a privatization opening, uh, that it's uh, money saving, cost savings. Um, but and, you know, as you read the media about what's happening, Ontario is in a bit of a, a, a mess right now with everything related to the third wave and the leadership decisions are being questioned on all parts for any member of the government. Anyone from Ontario want to grab the mic? Most people are afraid that right now it's 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 a bit of a very similar to Quebec in terms of and I and I, I wonder whether or not it's because of yeah left in the dark I think Lynn absolutely um, and what happened what triggered all this was a series of consultations that were being done on the QT about what was in the plans uh, and someone released the ministry's PowerPoint so. Um, that's what triggered a lot of the furor, but I often think, reflect back and wonder whether or not some of these tensions are being exasperated uh, because of what's happened to us over the past year uh, as well, the context. So it's, it, we'd like to say smoother heads will prevail, this too shall pass, we'll get back onto a normal kill, but at the same time, um, there's no, no guarantees that our, our next normal is going to be anywhere close to what our old normal was. And that's part of the, the issues. So any other comments on Ontario? One of the things that just to be aware, and I'm thinking from a BC perspective, because BC is moving into looking at a provincial LMS. Ontario's had a provincial LMS for a number of years. And that really has helped to support um, practice because it's aligned uh, the development of content, it's made it easier for teachers to make a transition because there were no real barriers, uh, you know, in terms of uh, cost. Uh, there's a robust support system that Ontario has because they have a district coordinator appointed for every board uh, to support e-learning in there. Um, the consortiums have been healthy in terms of their growth and their support. And Lynn, is, is uh, who made a comment there, she's part of Pavlofo as well. So it's it's you know it, it's a not a perfect system but when we first looked at the the four credits we said oh hang on a minute that's a fourfold increase it's possible if it's planned carefully you could move the consortiums and the whole models that are there forward i know lynn you're nodding your head so why don't you maybe grab the mic and add a few comments well it's it um so i'm with kevin so it's a the francophone consortium and um I can only speak for the French, uh, the, the French boards, because we actually um, serve all 12 of the French boards. And so what I can tell you is that this year we had a 275% increase of students, um, not only because of the pandemic, but also in response to um, the announcement about the four credits or the two credits now that are mandatory. So we were looking at scaling. What are we going to do in order to ensure that we can actually offer all of these online classes? We were just two years ago offering only grade 11 and 12 courses. This year we're offering nine to 12. We're over a hundred courses. We had 5,500 students registered in uh, the first semester, which we normally have 1,200. So we grew exponentially this year. Um, whether or not the boards will take over themselves, part of that uh, responsibility next year, uh, that is yet to be seen. And I think that is the, the question for us is to, to know because we are asynchronous learning. Um, the boards are looking into synchronous learning online. And that also is, is another um, big question as to which students will be registering for synchronous, which one will be registering for asynchronous with us. And then how are we going to get the funding separated up so that we can actually offer both systems because now we're offering three different systems in one province. <laughs> the devil's always in the details and the details sometimes are dictated to by how the funding goes because you can't move without money. Um, so it, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, a lot of noise in Alberta because of what's going on. So Amy, quick jump in before Allison and Frank tell us a little bit about what's going on in Alberta. 
Sure. Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to Saskatchewan and, and what's happening um, here is so in Saskatchewan, we don't have a centralized um, distance learning program. Um, and in fact, prior to COVID, only half of the school divisions in the province had any type of distance learning school. And of those, most of us were doing only the um, nine to 12. So we didn't have the full elementary and high school situation. Um, but this year, all school divisions in our province were um, expected to offer distance programming to our students. So all students who were not ready to return to school or weren't able to had to have a distance learning um, option through their school division. We were also told that um, teachers were not able to dual teach. That meant that you couldn't just have four students staying at home for the year from your classroom and deliver content to those four at home as well as your 20 in the school or, or whatever it was. So that meant that all of our schools, um, divisions in the province need to start essentially grade one to 12 um, online programs or expand their existing programs. So it was um, a big task and it was a lot of collaboration, support partnerships throughout the school divisions in the province. So even though there's not a centralized, um, a centralized system, we've all really worked together to kind of support each other. I know it's been a, we had kind of an ad hoc little committee prior to COVID and they were essentially my lifeline um, in August, September, October, as we were, you know, essentially building programs from the ground up. Um, we did have received funding from the government though to support this so one thing that we were lucky to do at least in our school division was we didn't have to um, move any teachers from the classroom to teach distance so um, we have a school of 400 elementary students and about 500 high school students and we didn't have to pull teachers from the classroom to do that which helped keep numbers in our classrooms down and numbers um, you know in our online supported in a, a proper way um, one of the right now in Saskatchewan like we are one of the provinces that are currently being hit again um, by variants and in particular actually um, in Regina where I am where we've been particularly hard hit and so right now um, we have as well as our distance programs for every school division has that there's also hybrid learning so all of the large high schools in our province are learning one day in the classroom one day online in different groups alternating and then in Regina, all of our schools um, have been online since March 26th, and we're expecting to hoping that the students will be able to go back um, as early as May 3rd. So we're seeing lots of different um, distance models throughout the province. Um, with us, our the, dis the full distance schools, it was very busy in September, but we've had kind of the consistency, to be honest, throughout the school year, whereas those who've been in person have been pivoting from in person to blended, to fully online and so they've been doing a really good job so it has been a lot of um, all hands on deck supporting those pieces um one of the challenges that that we're facing right now is um and it's probably not uncommon throughout um the rest of canada too is as right now we're seeing really really high covid numbers which has of course increased our population we also know that you know with vaccines and a few measures hopefully they'll be on the um the numbers will go down but we're trying to determine programming for next year and that right now that's probably our, our greatest challenge is to figure out what next year's programming is going to look like, especially because we're all servicing just our own students. So we have a school of 400 students in elementary and next year we might only be 100 and we but we just don't know. So it's really hard to staff or determine what programming. So am I going to have access to learning resource or French immersion and all those pieces. So this year. It's funny we are a year into it and we have an established school, but we honestly don't feel like we have more direction moving forward. So it's actually, again, still that whole year of inconsistency and uncertainty and um, and just the unknown. Because right now, if I asked, we surveyed our community what our numbers would be, they'd be very, very high. But in the fall, hopefully things would better. And, you know, that might shift the numbers as well. So I'm starting to hear a very consistent pattern happening across the country. Uh, independently and in isolation from each other. It's not like there's this conspiracy, but uh, is it consistent? I don't know. Frank, what's going on in Alberta? Well, in Alberta, education has had a very interesting year and uh, with any number of COVID issues and curriculum issues, focusing on just the distance portion, um, there is a concerted effort to move away from a centralized model. So while several school divisions, including Palliser, Calgary, Edmonton have had online schools. Um, there has been a central provider of instruction and resource as at a distance, the Alberta Distance Learning Center. It is now into the last two months of its existence. It's being uh, closed off. Its funding has been revoked by the ministry. Um, those resources are uh, 
um, in theory being absorbed by the ministry so that they can then become the distributor of them. But uh, word on the street is that that process has not been going um, very smoothly. So what's happening in its place is there's a, a move towards establishing other online schools. The latest funding manual for the province came out last month. And in it, uh, the two tidbits that uh, jumped to mind, there is a, a grant funding. It appears to be one time only for school divisions to establish their own online schools. And the second thing it does is that it takes the caps off of students' abilities to register with other divisions in online learning. So somebody in Calgary could um, uh, register with an Edmonton online school or somebody in Red Deer could register in Lethbridge. So those two pieces seem to move towards a granularization of distance education in Alberta, which is a little bit different from what I understand is happening in BC and certainly in Ontario. Interesting, Alison. Anything you want to add to your text comment as well? Yeah, this has been um, a pattern that I see emerging in the field is that with the, the service agreement changing that there's been an emerging balkanization really of service providers um, where in, in some districts, the, uh, the schools are being told to serve only their own students uh, online. And if the registrations are coming in after September 30th, our count date and the date upon which funding is determined, if it, and that's the date that staffing is determined, then uh, because as Frank mentioned, the the funding model is now no longer calculated based on credits earned throughout the year. It's, it's based on this one-time grant based on your September 30th registration. So some folks are feeling hesitant about, um, you know, when somebody in February says they need that Physics 30 for, for post-secondary, then the question becomes, will we take on that student? Um, yeah. Any and I do have a little, that, Frank? Yeah, I do have a little information on that. There is also a question about uh, caps that were in existence. This past school year, um, there was a cap uh, for distance ed providers of 500 students. Uh, as Allison mentioned, that was up till the September 30 count. And then after September 30, when they knew it wouldn't be funded, the cap was bumped up to 2000. It was a very odd situation. In the new uh, manual, there is no number cap. And to Allison's point, we made specific and pointed inquiries to the ministry. And if a student comes and registers with a distance ed school in December, January, February, that non-primary funding, in other words, you're not a student of that school, that non-primary funding will be awarded. That's according to the ministry. That seems very dubious to me. So I, it, there's a big question as to, if you take in another 5,000 of these non-primary students, will you ever actually see the funding for that? Oh, well, that's interesting. You got that information, Frank, and that was recent after the last um, budget manual came out, eh? Yeah, that's, that's what prompted us to ask. But there are other questions that we haven't answered. So if, uh, mm -hmm. if a student registers at online school A and online school B, does each school get that funding? Do they split the existing funding? What happens then? So as Randy says, devil's in the details, but there's no doubt, as Allison mentions, it's, it's about this splitting off. I'm, I'm, I'm likening it to Alberta becoming kind of like a Thunderdome and, you know, 50 schools enters and one school leaves. <laughs> and thanks, Daylene, for the clarification. Did you have anything else to contribute, Daylene, before we jump into BC? No, that's, um, it's interesting times uh, right across Canada, for sure. There's no question about that. So yeah. anyway, I appreciate uh, Frank yeah. and Allison chiming in on that. Great, thanks. And good to see you. But the big message is despite that, there is still a collaborative atmosphere in the field and helping each other out. And we can't take you because of blah, blah, blah. Can you help the student out and so on? That has remained in the field. Well, that's, that's great to hear. And actually, Allison, I might actually use that when we're talking at uh, DLAC uh, in June. 
in the session around compulsion for collaboration, because despite the odds, yes, we do see that uh, as educators, we band together and try to figure out. Uh, and in my history, uh, I've seen a lot of, you know, announcements and government direction from central and it kind of gets rationalized out. And then everybody figures out how to deal with it, gets comfortable, focuses on kids, provides good service, and then some new government comes in and they go and rattle everything again, and then you got to go through all that process. So that's kind and, of yeah. And Randy, you mentioned that proposal that you and Michael, I think, are working on. Do you uh, around that collaboration piece? Is that available? Is that publicly available yet? Uh, well, it's a it's a presentation we're doing in for okay. back in June, so we'll have that recording and archive, and we'll promote it through. Okay. afterwards great. i don't think there's Thank anything you. really insightful here other than you know why it's kind of like how we came together as candy learn it's because we want to help each other out and share and we learn by this and this is why we're in this session as well so so bruce you get kind of the last word and i do have a couple of the as we talked about we're this is what this session this whole symposium is about is to find out what's going on in bc as well yeah, this is an interesting conversation, Randy. Every time I'm listening to a regional uh, report, um, I'm, I'm seeing elements that have occurred in BC over the last 15 years. And, uh, you know, we've been at this a long time. And uh, this year, of course, uh, there's a lot of questions about what will happen in British Columbia following the pandemic. And, of course, some of these plans are underway. The centralization of the uh, LMS, uh, which I think the RPF just went out, the RFP just went out the other day. And then, of course, the conversations surrounding, um, you know, centralization of services. And, uh, you know, one of the things we have to recall about all of this is that uh, this is not about what's best for kids. This is mostly about funding. And it's governments trying to find ways to create some levels of equity for those districts that didn't get involved in funding, sorry, in, fund, in providing DL uh, opportunities for their students. Of course, this year, everybody's been forced into that role. So it's a rather interesting dynamic that during a pandemic, uh, most centralized models are really struggling because of the ramp up challenges. Um, just looking at the local context in the Okanagan, the number of students that uh, flooded to the online schools uh, was tremendous, three times larger in one year with no teachers to support them, except for the core elements that were already there and zero, almost zero training for those teachers that are thrown into that mix. And so that lands on the classroom teachers that are already existing in online schools to train the newbies. Nothing against them, it's just the situation is quite unique when you're dealing with DL uh, students rather than face-to-face. -face. And of course, one of the things that I think that has set uh, things in motion quite well over the last three or four years in BC is the rise of blended ed. Um, certainly uh, the whole idea surrounding blended is, uh, is, 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 is getting stronger and better. And I know that we all recognize that that, that element uh, can be one of the strongest models. But in the meantime, um, teachers are under a tremendous loads um, and obviously supporting their colleagues as they learn the whole uh, story surrounding DL and uh, moving forward. In BC, uh, collaboration has been front and center for some time. Um, we've got a great uh, uh, network of, of districts within the BC that work together through uh, distributed learning organizations as well as uh, development organizations like WCLN. And of course, um, that stretch now across Canada. But we'll be doing some more sessions uh, through this uh, um, later in the program, uh, tonight, this afternoon we have our AGM for WCLN and then tomorrow we'll be having our development meetings with our teachers and developers, so we invite you to be part of that. But more critically, I guess my concern moving forward is, is um, a centralized system uh, the best op option for BC? I'm not sure that it is. However, uh, this is uh, upon us and we'll see where that lands. I, one of the things I do respect though is that um, local districts will still have the opportunity to, to serve their own students. And that is uh, a bonus because that will hopefully create some some ability to uh, serve uh, during outbreaks as we go through the fall. Um, this isn't over just because vaccines are here uh, doesn't mean it's going to disappear in the fall. We're going to be dealing with outbreaks next year and, and uh, hopefully a lot less severe and hopefully uh, we can get back to some normalcy. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bruce. And, and a couple of things just to, to be aware of uh, that I would like to point out that are coming. Um, is is that uh, you know there's two sessions in the program, 
if you want to learn a little bit more in terms of the quality online learning is BC is the Ministry of Ed is looking at online. They're changing the name from distributed learning to online learning. Uh, and so they're, uh, Aaron and Maureen from the ministry are doing a piece around looking for input, but their focus is really around quality online as opposed to a more centralized, we need to control everything and reduce costs kind of model, which we're hearing in other places. So that bodes well. The other piece too is that Jennifer Riddle from the ministry will be doing sort of a holistic update on Friday uh, afternoon as well about this particular uh, models and approach what's going on in BC. So a couple of things that I just thought of in advance that I wanted to share with you is that, you know, basically, despite the stops and starts, uh, online learning though is not going away. We were concerned a year ago at this time with all the trashing that was going on about online is terrible. We need to be in classrooms, blah, 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 blah. Well, now what we're seeing is a number of jurisdictions that are saying they're planning deliberately for a program in September that they didn't have before or to merge or embellish. We have heard across Canada, it's very confusing because how we're gonna sort this out, work this out, it's still happening. If we put our trust that the kids will be at the central part and the resources will flow, like how we're getting monies out to support us in pandemic do flow out of governments, then I think we're going to figure this out well. Again, if there's money that flows. Now, the other thing about the pandemic practice is it exposed many inequities. Some of them are being addressed through government fundings and moving forward. Some of them are still going to be inequities. They were kind of hidden before, but they're not. It's kind of like all of us who work online, we know you can't hide any of your practice. It's openly visible to everyone. And that started to happen. So that I think is a good thing as well. But what it says without the investment and support uh, to make this happen, the growth will be limited and not serve all the students. So thinking that just